Right. Thank you. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Keith and Liliana and uh, Parmendra for this um, opportunity and the introduction. Um, some of you might have heard about the telemedicine program that uh, we have embarked upon in uh, at PHFI. So what I'm going to do is just to give the give a background of uh, what uh, we have been doing and the technologies that we have paid and how we are reaching to a larger population in India. And uh, we look forward to having a fruitful discussion with all of you in terms of scaling it up beyond uh, India. So let me start sharing my screen. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, right. Oh, sorry, I have forgotten to put my name here, but that's fine. Um, so the topic given to me was telehealth for low and middle income regions. So I just wanted to start off with this quote from the Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. So if you look at the health of populations across the world, it's clear to us that it's the best of times as well as the worst of times because a large majority of, um, uh, I mean, a small minority of the population across the world enjoys the best possible care, care uh, that uh, 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 that uses several advances in medicine such that, uh, you know, people have started living longer, not only they're living longer, but with the best quality of uh, life. On the other hand, we have, even worse than uh, 20th, uh, 19th century type of care in many parts of the world. And therefore we require innovations in terms of um, uh, improving care across the world uh, and providing a continuum of care starting from prevention to rehabilitation for individuals. And in this regard, the question that I posed was, uh, what are the technologies that can address health disparities and what is needed? So the first thing is we need to keep a good count of what is happening and we need surveillance. And for that, we look at electronic health records, biomedical sensors and data collection through mobiles and uh, tablets. The second is early uh, diagnosis and screening of the population. And again, here there are several technologies that are available for us that includes computerized risk assessment and so on. In terms of the management, we have the electronic decision support system, pharmaceutical innovations, newer drugs, but also simplified drugs. I mean, use repurposing drugs. So there are many of the things which have been given up in the past have been repurposed at low cost and have been used. And the next one is the telehealth program. The last includes capacity building on scale, on massive scale, which can be which we can use online and learning management system, uh, improving drug drug distribution, digital clinical trials, using geographical information system to identify hotspots of disease and so on. But due to paucity of time, I'm going to talk about only two aspects today, the electronic decision support system and the telehealth program that we are conducting. So the first question that people ask is in terms of ML technologies. This was published way back around eight or nine years back as to what the role of uh, ML technologies would be. For the consumers, it provides improved convenience, more active engagement in self-care and greater personalization. For clinicians, it reduces the demands on their time and refocuses on the art of the art of medicine. And it had the potential or has the potential to change every aspect of the healthcare environment and do, to do so while delivering better outcomes, better quality and substantially lowering costs. But at that particular point of time, there was a real need for clinical trial evidence to provide a roadmap for its implementation and innovation that is low cost and potentially scalable and sustainable and make real differences to people. So we had done a costing analysis of task shifting because I mean, one, the other thing that we needed to do was to pair these technologies, simple technologies with uh, community health workers and uh, non-physician healthcare providers. So Dr. Tom Gaziano from Howard and I uh, worked on a economic modeling to see what would be the benefit of just providing a three-day pro training program and training community health workers in the management of hypertension. And we estimated that there would be almost $700,000 in hospital savings per million population annually. And this was done for India actually. 700 cardiovascular deaths averted per million and 750 hospitalization for stroke or MI averted. Now this, we pegged the annual salary of the community health worker at around $3,500, but 
given the fact at that particular point of time, the annual salary of um, uh, community health workers was close to $1,500. The program itself was cost saving, uh, but there was, this was just a economic modeling and there was a need for a proof of concept as well as to see whether it was, uh, it could work. The second thing was a plan to develop disruptive innovations that would change thinking and practice. So we embarked upon this journey where we um, uh, paid task shifting and task sharing with technology enabled improved health quality delivery models and quality improvement studies. So these were the principles that we used in all the studies. These are some representative studies in the last 10 years that we have done, I'm putting it up here, uh, that included electronic decision support system, integrated care, quality improvement program, rehabilitation, because I work in the space of cardiac, uh, cardiovascular disease, we said cardiac rehabilitation and team-based care. So these studies were conducted across the whole spectrum of the health system, starting from the community to primary care to secondary care. It encompassed several um, innovations, including traditional approaches such as yoga for rehabilitation, uh, quality improvement program through audit system uh, within the clinics, and um, integrated care, for example, managing diabetes and uh, depression together. So there were several features that we studied in the last 10 years and showed that actually these uh, ML technologies are quite useful. I'll, I'll elaborate upon, upon that a little bit later. Now, what is this uh, uh, ML system? We call it the Empower Heart ML system, which is a clinical decision support system for evidence-based care. So it had three packages, a clinical decision support system, which provided a holistic approach for evaluation, screening, investigation, clinical management, and follow-up schedule. It was based on accepted guidelines. There were algorithms validated by experts and proven in clinical research. There was a personalized lifestyle recommendation for patients. There was inbuilt record keeping, trending and charting at patient level and at practice level. And uh, there were other required features for care and delivery management. In fact, in the back end, we had put in 2,500 case studies and paired it with a machine learning algorithm so that every patient would get a personalized management plan when they were used when the system was used. The, in terms of the task shifting, we empowered non-physician workforce to deliver quality care by using technology. And we provided training and access to expert, expertise uh, through structured training program, well-researched and internationally acknowledged clinical modules with regular refinements by experts in clinical and technology domains. Now, this is how the workflow looked for these people who use the Empower platform. The patient would walk in and get uh, referred by the uh, auxiliary nurse, midwife, or an equivalent worker, and go to the nurse care coordinator who would enter the initial assessment exam and examination details into the nurse portal. Now, in India, the nurses are not allowed to prescribe uh, drugs. It's only the medical officer, a trained physician who can do that. So we created a system in which the nurse in, uh, uh, entered all the data that was required from the patients. It would take around seven to eight minutes of a time. And that would be printed, I mean, based on the um, inputs, the, there would be a personalized management plan, the diagnosis, as well as the details of the patient, which would, which would be printed and sent across to the medical officer. One might ask, why are we using this non-environment friendly method of printing paper? But the reason was because medical officers, doctors at that time were very, very reluctant to use tablets or any kind of um, ML device. And therefore, we gave them the printed uh, uh, information. Now, based on this information, they could accept the, they would accept whatever was uh, suggested, or they could rewrite the prescription based on their uh, thinking. But majority of the time, nearly seventy percent of the time, it was accepted, and therefore, uh, we thought it was uh, quite a big success, at least in terms of the physician acceptance. Then the patient would come back to the nurse care coordinator, who would update the patient record in their app. And in addition, provide lifestyle advice because the doctors are not providing the lifestyle advice. Nurses were providing lifestyle advice. They would actually schedule the next appointment. And uh, there, there were auto-texting features so that the patient can come back once again, once the, um, uh, the, they get the alert or the nurse can call the patient if the patient doesn't turn up. So this, and then the patient walked out with the prescription. I mean, this looked like a great model, but it required evaluation. And this is what we did. I mean, prior to this, we had done uh, randomized trials and showed that it worked. Now we wanted to see, does it work in real life settings where we are using um, the, uh, at a community health center, where we are using the health system uh, staff as well as uh, some assisted research staff. So we um, 
did this demonstration project in the state of Himachal Pradesh, which is around 300, uh, 250 miles north of Delhi. It's a hilly area. And over a period of 21 months in six outpatient clinics, we screened around 21,000 patients, which means that anybody who was above the age of 30 years was screened for hypertension and diabetes. And we found that nearly 6,800 of them, that's close to 30%, had either hypertension and diabetes. But the important point that I want to make is that nearly 50% were first-time detections. And therefore, it was very important that these people would have gone without detection because the general, given the general um, crowded OPDs, uh, patients were just being managed symptomatically. Like, for example, if they came with a fever, they would get a Tylenol or some investigation and go away. No opportunistic screening for hypertension or diabetes would be done. And in this case, this was done. The second thing that happened was we ensured that simple drugs were available in these clinics. And what we found was the end of three months, the systolic blood pressure had fallen substantially. I've not shown diastolic blood pressure, which is also the same, but a very high fall in the fasting blood sugar, which persisted till 18 months. And in fact, we were surprised when you saw the result that there was a 15 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure, seven millimeter drop in diastolic blood pressure, and nearly 50 milligrams per deciliter drop in glucose levels. And this we published in the Journal of American Art Association way back in 2016. The, the, there were no fancy drugs, no fancy investigations. All that was done was a very simple model of care, which used uh, easily available drugs that were inexpensive for the system. So building on this, we actually scaled this up in a state in the uh, northeastern part of uh, India called Tripura and in Mizoram. And, uh, we recruited more than 200,000 patients uh, from all the uh, healthcare centers, the primary and the secondary healthcare centers in this, and it was uh, widely accepted by the cl uh, clinicians and also uh, by the government. Now we are attempting a national level scale up uh, that includes referral linkages and other innovations um, in uh, multiple, uh, in, in a city in the state of Punjab, which again is to the north of India and uh, it's ongoing, so we'll get the results in another one and a half years or so. We also assisted the, uh, the WHO in digitizing its M pen package, and we called it the M pen package, and it's being used in Maldives. So we have covered the following diseases over the uh, last uh, several years, which includes hypertension, diabetes, depression, alcohol use, tobacco use, and dyslipidemia. But we are moving towards symptom-based decision support system because the patients don't come with hypertension or diabetes, but they do come with uh, symptoms. And from those symptoms, we try and branch off into um, identifying uh, non-communicable diseases, or even if they come with um, antenatal, come for antenatal care, we have created a system in which uh, we can detect pregnancy-induced hypertension, gestational diabetes early, and uh, we are moving towards identifying uh, comorbidities. So this was the background of the package that we have developed. Now came the COVID pandemic and the uh, government actually liberalized the rules for telemedicine and that gave us an opportunity to integrate many of the innovations that we had carried out into this integrated telehealth package, which I'm going to uh, talk about. Now, despite this liberalization, there were uh, several um, technological divide that existed. There was poor, poor penetration and acceptance of the telemedicine in rural areas and subpar utilization in urban areas. So the challenges were threefold. The first challenge was at the patient level. There was challenges in accessing telemedicine services due to literacy language or even uh, digital illiteracy among patients. And they would uh, most of the system that we have in telemedicine is just getting a virtual consultation with a doctor and they had to initiate the consultation. They would go to the wrong physician or wrong specialty. And therefore the uh, doctors would get frustrated. Moreover, the doctors did not have any details. There was a lack of good clinical history. They had to get it from the patients. There were no physical examination findings. And many times, laboratory parameters were not available to aid physicians in the evidence-based decision-making. And uh, in the terms of the health system itself, there are several multiple innovations freestanding in digital health technology. Interoperability was a big issue. And so we needed to put them on a single platform. And that's what we attempted. So we call this Digi Sahayam. Digi is for digital. Sahayam is help in uh, many Indian languages. So we just paired that and called Digi Sahayam an assisted telemedicine uh, solution. So the aim was that um, 
to improve access to quality healthcare through bridge personnel trained in providing assistant telemedicine solutions. So what are the salient features of this uh, program, Digi Sahai? First, it involved upscaling skills of health workers in providing assistant telemedicine. It uh, aimed at improving access to primary and tertiary care through trained personnel. It uh, improved quality of care through <clears throat> point of care diagnostic and electronic clinical decision support system. It also reduced the need for follow-up visits to health facilities. And there was real-time monitoring and feedback mechanism that ratio of quality standards. Yes. So just to summarize, these are the three important barriers which I had mentioned earlier. And the solution was for the first thing, literacy language and technological barriers among patients, the trained healthcare workers connected, conveyed findings uh, to facilitate doctor-patient interactions and also prevent wasteful visits. The second was at the physician level. So here the trained health workers collected history, performed physical examination, and carried out lab investigations, uh, investigations before initiating teleconsultations, thereby saving time and improving quality of care. In terms of interoperability, the PHFI telemedicine platform embeds electronic health records, point of care diagnostics, inbuilt electronic uh, uh, clinical decision support system, and numerous state-of-the-art digital technologies. So we call this the PHFI innovation cortex to just rhyme with uh, the brain cortex. And uh, let me describe the platform. So the platform comprises of electronic health records, point of care diagnostics, electronic decision support system, and numerous state of art digital health technologies. The first is the Empower Electronic Clinical Decision Support System, which I spoke about a little bit earlier, and I'm not going to delve further into it, but it's a very robust electronic decision support system format. The second technology that we paired was the Swasti Sahai device, which is a point of care diagnostic device, which is an affordable Android based point of care device that integrates multiple diagnostics to cater to the needs of the frontline uh, health workers to facilitate service delivery to the population they serve. The investing, there are two versions of this. The basic version is aligned to the Indian public health standards, mainly aimed at antenatal care. But the advanced version that we are planning and we are actually in the process of developing would get um, uh, investigations that are relevant to non-communicable diseases such as uh, serum creatinine, uh, lipid profile, and hemoglobin A1c. We added uh, an ECG machine called CardioScreen, which is a scalable 6 to 12 handheld portable ECG device uh, developed by an Indian company. It's quick to use and works in conjunction with uh, other Android devices. It has a cloud-based system with AI interpretation and risk classification. It has actually been certified by the FDA and uh, CE. The next uh, uh, two devices are the conventional stethoscope, but this is a digital stethoscope, uh, which is a fully assembled stethoscope that travels between analog and amplified listening modes. Uh, it enables remote auscultation by the treating physician and as serves as the physician's ears at the telemedicine center. I'll actually demonstrate that a little bit uh, later for you. The next one is we wanted to give eyes to the physician, so we uh, paired it with a high-definition camera, which could be operated by the physician who was sitting remotely to examine the patient and um, uh, to talk to them. This is how the software looks like. So if I go to the next slide, I can just show some of the features. Actually, uh, because of the paucity of time, I'm not demonstrating the whole thing, but I'm just kind of uh, explaining the various features in this uh, platform. So if, when you press on this general physical examination, it provides general physical examination findings which are captured by the healthcare worker. There's a template-based history. I, I spoke about the symptom-based DSS. This is a variant of that through which a presenting personal, past, family, and drug history are captured. Then uh, we get vitals from, from the visits with uh, trends. Like for example, you could get a trend of the blood pressure over three or four visits. Pulse, like if you're managing, COVID patients acutely, you can get the heart rate and you can get um, the SAO2 and many other uh, investigations. Lab results also will be provided with trends. Then ECG readings will be available based on the AI report, but will require a physician interpretation. And the electronic decision support system uh, is there for diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, and asthma and would give the uh, personalized management plan for the patients. Finally, there is an e-prescription entry and a prescription history that's provided and a markup for follow-up visit and markup for reference. The interesting feature about um, the auscultation you can hear 
there's a noise cancellation feature. You can very clearly hear the second heart sound at the level C. We have marked this so that the nurses or the community health worker can place this set for the physician to hear remotely. And you can very clearly hear the second heart sound at the uh, second heart uh, level. Um, and we can clearly, uh, the, the split of the second heart sound is clearly audible here. So this is the system that we have. Now coming to the mode of service delivery, there are various modes we are adopting and we will adopt in the future. The conventional mode is a brick and mortar model where the telemedicine center is run by a trained nurse and a lab technician that provide assisted telemedicine solutions under the supervision of a project quality assurance officer. The general physician specialist as well as super specialist teleconsultations are made available uh, through this assisted telemedicine platform. Existing private as well as public health facilities can be upgraded to perform assisted telemedicine. Now the workflow was very similar to the electronic DSS program. Here the patient visits the clinic, the trained nurse takes history and examination. Any lab tests are done if necessary with the point of care device that we have provided. A consultation with the doctor is initiated. A virtual consultation with the special doctor, specialist doctor if required can be done. Actually this also can be done away with, but because this is an initial proof of concept program, we thought to have a doctor would be useful, but actually this, particular thing is redundant because we can act, actually position this doctor at this level and uh, escalate the higher consultations from there. So the post consult uh, uh, counseling is provided by the nurse. I'm not getting into the full details of this because this is how the Indian uh, public health system works with uh, multiple levels of care. So at the lowest level, we have the health and wellness center, then we have the primary health center, then we have the urban health center and we have the community health center at the secondary level. And we have actually identified the human resources for each of these, which is given here. But what I want to say here is this is generally applicable to any part of the world because most systems are with minor variations are similar. And, the, uh, and because the um, lowest level of healthcare provider is involved, even in very low resource settings, we can use this uh, telemedicine package. The second is an on-foot telemedicine assistance for uh, small populations with less than 1,000 or, uh, or so, or also for people who are unable to visit the clinic because of uh, physical disabilities or because they're bedridden or many other reasons they, can, they may not be able to come. So one might ask, how did we manage this? All that is required are these two small bags, a backpack and a small bag, which will carry all these uh, equipments the total weight of which is not more than four kgs, comfortable to carry, and uh, and you can just go to the houses and initiate a teleconsultation. Here is an example of a teleconsultation that has been initiated. Um, so it can be used both for rural as well as urban population, and uh, services could be charged for generating revenue for trained healthcare workers. I mean, one business model is we could give it to healthcare workers, train them, and they can become the agents of this uh, program uh, connecting to the telemedicine consultation and also would be a livelihood uh, for them. It can improve health access for elderly and bedridden patients. Then we have another program called the mobile kiosk setup, which can actually come into a small suitcase and you can just go ahead and uh, set it up wherever it's required. Like um, it's very useful in surveillance program or in uh, programs to create awareness, but also it can be used for creating consultations. Uh, but it, it can be, it is most likely uh, to be used in small villages with populations of less than 5,000, where you are unable to establish a brick and mortar clinic. So somebody can go assemble this and have it in their uh, community centers where people could be screened for chronic conditions and also provide facilitated, uh, facilitate assisted telemedicine services. The next one is uh, Digi Sahayam on wheels. Uh, this is, uh, can be used in sparsely uh, distributed small population of less than 5,000 individuals. Here, physical space would not be required because this vehicle would be customized to perform uh, like a brick and mortar uh, telemedicine clinic. And these are useful in hard to reach areas. It again can perform both screening as well as management of patients. Now, this is the concept with which we developed. I'm going to give you a practical example of the community reach and impact of the program that we have done. So apart from the telemedicine program itself, we also organize specialist camps, health promotion visits, so that the community, actually the, uh, the health of the community improves. So we do health promotion visit, 
There are doorstep consultations and assistance services, educational webinars, weekly community empowerment live sessions, and collaborations with different institutions to extend our services. So essentially what we are attempting to do is to bridge the gap between the community, technology, and digital healthcare through trained personnel, provide continuity of care and longitudinal health data through use of inbuilt electronic health records, create an innovative model for health service delivery that enhances sustainability, accessibility, and affordability of care. It also would reduce indirect healthcare costs uh, related to travel and loss of daily wages, provide valuable data that can inform the development of suitable healthcare models, prevent complications through improved awareness, early detection, treatment. And in fact, we are improving the quality of care and in, in our modules for primary care physicians, we emphasize the importance of looking, for example, <clears throat> when we did a survey around 10 years back, only 7% of the doctors were annually screening patients for uh, neuropathy or retinopathy. But once you give them a structured package, that uh, screening level improves and it actually reduces the complications. So the health, the health technology that we're using helps to address cost. There is a uh, tremendous quality control over there. It's interoperable, it's scalable, which we have shown. There is uh, enhanced user experience. It addresses the contextual needs and caters to the privacy issues. In addition, it is environmental friendly. In fact, one of the recommendations uh, to uh, prevent climate change or to mitigate climate change and reduce air pollution is the use of telemedicine. Because in countries like India, it's not only the patient who comes to the clinic, the footfall is very high because at least two relatives accompany the patients. And second, they have to use some form of transport to reach the hospital. So all that can be avoided if we can have a hybrid model where people who really require to visit the clinic or the hospital make the visits and others are provided care through telemedicine. And this was featured in COP26. This is one of the technologies. And uh, PHF had four other technologies which include included the drones to deliver drugs and to collect blood samples and get it analyzed in different places and uh, uh, the point of care device and others. So let me give some practical examples now. We are conducting uh, telemedicine programs in three clinics, one in the northern part of Tamil Nadu in its capital, uh, Chennai, and in the uh, southern part of uh, Tamil Nadu uh, in a place called Pasuvantanai, which is in the far south of uh, Tamil Nadu. So three clinics have been established, and these are some of the glimpses of the clinic uh, where you can see uh, people working on the point of care device, then a teleconsultation, which is ongoing, and a consultation with the local doctor here. The second thing is uh, the WHO was very impressed with when we presented the data on the telemedicine in Chennai. So they said we should uh, demonstrate that it works in a government setting. The previous one was with... Uh, 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 CSR funding, a charity, charity program, but they wanted to see whether we can work with the government systems. So we spoke to the government of Karnataka and South India, and they have agreed, uh, we have signed an MOU, and we'll start the program next month. Uh, these are our partners, which includes the WHO and several others. We are adding new investigations. For example, the Arvind IK system uh, pro program is a leader in uh, ophthalmology care and it has been featured as one of the sustainable models of healthcare. And so we are working with them in terms of providing eye care. So what has been the impact so far? So in the last uh, eight or nine months, we have um, uh, provided almost 5,640 consultations of which 3,750 were general consultation and around 1,800, uh, 900 were specialist consultation. And um, uh, ECG was actually rationed and taken. So it's somewhat lower. And these are the number of lab tests that were conducted. So in terms of the specialist conduct uh, distribution, a large majority were general medicine followed by pediatrics and uh, gynecology. But currently we are focusing on four major specialities that is general medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, and dermatology. Uh, we also provided 80 plus um, doorstep assistance for people who are unable to come to the clinic. And um, at least 18 per, uh, patients of, this, uh, of these 80 were treated of their conditions. Uh, we, to create awareness and interest in the community, we have conducted specialist uh, clinics. So we conducted a total of 19 camps uh, of various diseases and treated around uh, 1,200 patients or so. We make uh, home visits for health promotion. Uh, so each month, 
that was a specific uh, disease entity to spread awareness in the community. For example, the importance of salt reduction or uh, alcohol use for hypertension, as an example, physical activity for diabetes, and uh, so on and so forth, maintaining hygiene, water, sanitation, and hygiene. These kind of uh, promotional activities were conducted in this community so that the community becomes healthier as a whole. So this is the summary of the whole uh, program in uh, Chennai. And uh, we touched 14,000 plus lives, including home visits and uh, the people we have interacted with. And we identified new NCDs in around 600 of these people and were referred to the consultations. There were new detect newly detected hypertension was 250. Patients with high BMI was identified to this number and were provided uh, advice with regard to how to reduce that. So. Uh, it, it is a composite activity of everything uh, that is required for the completing the continuum of care. So what's the patient feedback? I mean, that's a, they are the most important consumers. I won't take too much of time on this, but these were the five domains in uh, on which we asked using a Likert scale and we surveyed uh, 139 patients. On a scale of uh, zero to five, we were somewhere a little higher than four for all these uh, domains that we looked at. So in terms of satisfaction, again, there was overall satisfaction with the healthcare services of the clinic, satisfaction with the healthcare delivery model, and likelihood of recommending clinic for diagnosis and treatment to others was almost at the level of four. So there was a good uh, satisfaction for this uh, program. Finally, what is the way forward? We need to in indulge in large-scale capacity building initiatives for health workers in providing assisted telemedicine we need to pilot different modes of assisted telehealth uh, delivery, improve quality of care through in integration with additional digital health uh, technologies, adapt and expand these to other countries with similar health system difficulties, and embed research to evaluate and improve existing technologies. Now, when we look at this whole program that I presented, on the surface, it looks like we are just trying to improve access to healthcare uh, through bridge personal using telemedicine. But there are several other features uh, that are embedded in this, which are under the surface. One, you generate a lot of electronic health record data, which can provide real-time patient-centered records for secondary data analysis. Second, there is a large number of well-trained staff, nurses, paramedical staff, and digital health technologies to carry out complex data collection, and they can be used uh, in research uh, of this program and in surveillance. There is a community outreach arm with an opportunity to conduct population level surveys and studies. There's infrastructure to evaluate and scale up digital uh, technologies platform to test interoperability, acceptance, and appropriateness of digital health technologies. We can use this for digital disease surveillance and uh, for capacity building. So we can use this for building capacity of students and research staff through embedded research projects. So that's all I wanted to say. And uh, thank you very much uh, for having me and listening to this uh, presentation, a bit of uh, monologue here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic work that you're doing. And um, I'm in awe really of uh, all the amazing um, things, digital health related, even the, the status quo, I had no idea that that existed and it could be used um, in, in telehealth. It's quite amazing. Um, I'll start with the questions and then we can see if others have questions. Um, I was interested in understanding what you um, found as the major barriers to implementing this across India and whether there were um, contextual factors um, that made it uh, more difficult in particular areas um, or other um, types of barriers? I think in terms of barriers, if you think there are multiple, number one, I think in a philosophical sense, this is a total disruption of the healthcare, the patient-doctor-patient uh, -patient relationship, which was premised on the touch and the feel, and that is not there. So that's one mm -hmm. uh, which people are unable to fathom. Second is there are competing telemedicine programs. The government itself has got a program called eSingly, but many of them are basically in terms of remotely connecting patient to the doctor, but many of the features here uh, are not there. So uh, initially people were saying that, no, no, we have done this on scale. So why do we need another platform? 
so now now it has been accepted in karnataka when he spoke to the government they have agreed that this is a good program and they are willing to implement so the biggest challenge is people worry that such kind of programs like ours is creating a parallel system and uh, not integrating but the ultimate aim is to integrate with the larger system and use it the third is we are largely focused on government healthcare we are not um, uh, focused on the private healthcare and so that's another area where we should work on because 70% of the care in india is with the private providers and therefore i think there's a huge market potential over there um so there will be teething troubles about the equipment and in fact uh, it took me lot, took us a lot of time to get the health workers to use the uh, stethoscope because they were quite they found that it was little different from the conventional stethoscope they found it daunting they were not using it and oh, um, we said, shame. <laughs> yeah but, but it took some time so it takes time it takes uh, perseverance it takes training and um, it takes advocacy and it also also they get feedback from patients and patients were fascinated that they were getting something very different so again you gave them the touch that uh, they required very interesting um i have a question here from uh, rajaram who asks what are um the impacts of this ncd management program implementation right and right now this is in a yeah so yeah. right now this uh, is i can I can add to that because yeah, there was please. also something that I was um, wondering about. Do you have any sort of uh, cost-effectiveness evaluation, or is that planned? Um, and can you talk a little bit about the the impact? Actually, this is a very short-term evaluation that we have done. Cost-effectiveness is a larger evaluation, so we we will have to do the impact evaluation in terms of how the NCD care has been. the obviously we cannot do any hard outcomes it will be only process outcomes like um, how many visits they made are they taking their drugs regularly are they getting their drugs and um, uh, what's a, i mean we can of course get blood pressure but it's a pre post design you just sometimes you know uh, when you measure blood pressure multiple times or blood glucose multiple times there is a regression to the mean and it may appear that it is reducing but the fact is uh, it's important for us to look at some of the process outcomes which actually would translate into real benefit and th those include the the time saved for the patient the um, uh, daily the, the wages that they have earned because they didn't go to the hospital it takes a day full day for them to go to a hospital and come back all those kind of uh, intangibles we will have to measure of, of course cost effectiveness is one of those which is very important which we are looking at maybe take one more year or so um amazing and and just touching on that i think it would be interesting to so you had some sort of uh patient feedback via a survey um uh, maybe interviewing some patients and doing a a qualitative uh, kind of analysis of their responses would be interesting because i'm guessing there might be um very interesting aspects there on facilitators various things they enjoyed or or things that could be improved um i think you hit the nail on the head the current thinking is core design we mm. we didn't really do the core design component but as we scale it up and as we move along to different territories we are embarking on core design plans where we involve patients in the design because they are the consumers ultimately and they know what the pain points are and they would help us in terms of um, modifying and rectifying any mistakes that are on the way right uh we have a question here from anna luisa and she says congratulations on such an amazing program of work i was wondering if you have performed or are willing to any evaluation on safety of remote care yes i think we should do it because uh, as a as an epidemiologist and a person who has been active in clinical trials i'm always wary of um, you know the pre post design showing that um, things improve so i i think it's uh, you need a you need some kind of a trial maybe a cluster rct or a delayed intervention a step based design trial or so in terms of uh, showing but given that it's so becoming so popular and getting well established it may be a little difficult to do but um, we could look at uh, communities before introduction of telemedicine after introduction some kind of thing like that uh we require to innovatively think in terms of the evaluation 
Great. Any other questions, Keith? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Prabhakar. I but I'm always impressed. I think this is the third time I've seen this presentation and uh, learn each time I, uh, I view it. Um, I think uh, just a comment, uh, what I am most impressed with, maybe we'd like to hear a little bit more with the leveraging of the community health worker. Uh, and the reason behind my question, I know there are some other programs that, that use this, but one of the concerns was, uh, and I think it's healthy entrepreneurs, for example, in Africa, uh, leverages community health workers, but they're not funded. It's volunteer. Uh, and those community health workers are expected to come up with the what can be uh, financially burdening the cost of the equipment to engage. So add in that along with assigning them fairly significant health responsibilities uh, on a pro bono or for free basis. So I wonder, the uh, you mentioned the salaries. Can you expand a little bit about the economic model? Because that's where a lot of these programs really struggle, right, to sustainability and funding. So I'd like uh, to hear a little more on that. Because that, that's very impressive. So a few points that I want to make is that uh, the programs cannot be sustained on a voluntary mode. That's uh, number one, because uh, we are uh, actually focusing too much on the innate goodness of people to contribute to the success of this program. So in India also, there is this voluntary program, but uh, they are paid. Uh, like uh, there's something called the Accredited Social Health Activists or the ASHAs, um, who are um, women from uh, the local community who, who are between 18 to 24 years and who provide assistance to antenatal care and delivery. So it started well-intentioned, it worked very well. They were getting a kind of stipend, not a full salary, and, for, and also getting incentives for hospital deliveries. So the incentives for the hospital deliveries were very high. So the focus largely became getting the patients and they forgot about the importance of antenatal care. So one needs to be very careful in terms of how to incentivize these patients, the incentivize these individuals. But I think the, the way to go is to use the existing health workers. And um, uh, like, like there are many health workers who have become redundant because in India, we have several vertical programs. We had a program for control of guinea worms. We had a program for control of leprosy. We have the polio immunization program. Many of these diseases, as they get conquered, uh, these pe people become redundant to the system. So they can be retrained and repurposed and used for this uh, program because they're already employed. The second is in the National Program of India for uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. It's called uh, cardiovascular cancer and diabetes prevention program. There is an extra personnel who, who is sanctioned by the government of India. And it's, it works in a partnership model with the state governments and the central government. And um, uh, that extra person can be used for these, uh, these kind of um, activities. Uh, but we have to be very careful that these health workers are not overburdened because there's a tendency to use them for all kinds of programs. So there has to be that multi-sectoral dialogue, even within the health ministry, I'm not talking about the beyond the Ministry of Health, but even within that, there has to be a dialogue with the workers, with the um, physicians and with the administrators in terms of how to optimal, optimally use these individuals. In terms of Africa itself, I think we can create a uh, business model where for every service they provided, there's a small amount of incentive which uh, would be provided from the profits that are earned if you're providing it on a private basis. We can skill these people and uh, give a franchisee model so that uh, they earn money as well as treat patients. So you can think of other means. I mean, there may be other ways. We should talk to the management guys to see if there are other mechanisms. Do you ever foresee a blending of, uh, you know, a private offering that could uh, stoke revenues or a revenue share with public based? Is that a model at all that would work? People have been talking about the public-private partnership model. Uh, it requires refinement because the, the private sector thinks that the government or the public sector should provide the infrastructure and they make the profit. So I don't think that model would work. So uh, we require to refine. It's a long process because inherent in the DNA of private sector is to make profit. Inherent in the public sector... Uh, though the return is to provide service is inefficiency. So I think we need to overcome the inefficiency of the public sector 
and the profit motives in the private sector. So related to that, uh, I, I'm curious about how you, you um, where the funding came from for, for the work that you presented. And um, when you think about scaling it up, what is the plan um, for, for funding it? Right. And then the first uh, tranche of funding came to us from an insurance company because they had this um, corporate social responsibility program or the CSR program, as it's popularly called. In India, every uh, private concern uh, has to pledge 1% of its profit towards social services, and it's called corporate social responsibility. So they had um, some funds, and they asked us whether they would be they, uh, have do something about NCD care. And that's when um, Arun and I had a discussion and we came up with a plan of uh, creating this telemedicine program. And of course, Dr. Dev Jindal is here who's worked uh, actively on the ML program. And we paid all these technologies. We did this very rapidly within a matter of two months or so. In fact, the first approach to us was last November. And uh, by February, we had everything up and running. The clinic started in February end. So within four months, we had the discussion with them, we got the funding, we employed people, we uh, actually rebuilt that uh, building in terms of um, organizing. So uh, it was an amazing job by Arun and group and um, uh, we rolled it out. So that was the first level of funding. The second question is about scale up. The scale up has to happen only with uh, the help of the government or with large private sector organizations. So we are advocating with the government in terms of um, looking at um, how to scale up across the country. So uh, we need a little bit more data to provide them with the robust evidence that it works. Second is we are also looking at uh, large grants like we recently applied to this NIHR uh, uh, center grant, which aims to, uh, with the aim of using telemedicine for multimorbidity as a thing. So once you have the evidence, once you start doing such uh, big projects, I think uh, there, people will gravitate towards this kind of the system. There will be resistance, but we'll have to overcome that resistance. Mm, that's great. Uh, and just one more question for me, and then I'll see if anyone else has questions. Uh, I was wondering what was the impact of COVID um, with, with all of this? Uh, were there any particular challenges or, or did COVID um, accelerate the, the adoption of, of this program? Actually, the program came up because of COVID. Because of COVID, mm. there was a liberalization. The government realized that, you know, patients cannot visit hospitals like before and uh, to avoid overcrowding, et cetera. But the second part of the problem was um, when actually a huge surge of COVID happened, we had to close down for some time, basically because um, most of the care, most of the people who came were for COVID and not for non-communicable diseases. So for some time, maybe a week or so, we closed down. But it has actually helped screening, uh, uh, advocacy, management, and um, rehabilitation processes of non-communicable diseases. And it's a great idea to do it virtually. Like, for example, post-MI rehabilitation, post-stroke rehabilitation. The conventional program entails that the patients visit the clinics for at least uh, once a week for 12 to 13 weeks. Now you can do all the training of these patients virtually. So, and uh, you have very high quality pictures and videos for them um, to be trained after the initial visit. So I think the pandemic has actually helped advancing the cause of telemedicine. Great, great work. Um, any other questions? Then Dr. Rohan Munis has asked whether we can write to you. Uh, you're welcome to write to us. And um, Arun, can we put the email um, ID on the chat? I was just going to make a comment. What I'm also impressed with, you mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Prabhakaran, the, uh, the interoperability. And I can tell you, even in developed part of the world, uh, like here in Canada, we think we have a very robust health system and we struggle with this, right? We have the pharmacies, the hospitals, and 
uh, primary care providers all on different systems. Uh, and the fact that you've created or have a telemedicine platform that the specialist can see the same information that I'm seeing, the pharmacist can see the same information I'm seeing, the nurse, the healthcare worker. I think really that that's a critical point. Um, and I'm also just thinking, you know, of how much I do on a day-to-day -day basis as a primary care provider. A lot of it is, you know, maybe it sounds harsh to say frivolous work, but I'm so caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff that really, you know, do I need to be seeing the patient myself for their blood pressure, for their diabetes, some of these non-communicable diseases. And I become the choke point in the system because the patients can't access me uh, because I'm burdened with these other responsibilities. To delegate that task into the community uh, really makes so much sense in workflow. Um, kudos, right? I mean, I think this is a disruption that, that we need. Uh, and I'm sure there's, there's challenges because there's some of us that maybe hang on to that concept that I'm the doctor, I'm the physician, I know best. It's, it's me that should be doing this and delegating those tasks can be a challenge, but I think it's where it's got to go for sure. It's amazing. Thank you. So I, I thought uh, in conclusion, uh, in terms of way forward, I forgot to mention one more thing uh, is how do we address the issue of privacy? And for that, I think we should borrow from the Bitcoin technology, the blockchain technology where it's disaggregated data which is owned by the patient and the patient actually permits the doctors or who is going to use the data to see the data so i think we need to think out of the box in multiple ways but ultimately whatever we do we have to um, uh, think about the cultural cult culture sensitivity the context in which it is being used the um, cost and the cost effectiveness, the equity of the program, uh, the ease of the program. And um, I mean, obviously the interoperability is also a major issue. So I think we need to address all this and think from these multiple angles to make this uh, scalable. Fantastic work. Um, Keith, do you, wanna, do you wanna close the session? I think we should let Dr. Uh, Prabhakaram go because uh, he's been so kind and generous with his time. And uh, this uh, was a great session. Uh, uh, absolutely, thank you so much. And I can see already this is a great warm up for next week. Uh, we will have much to, uh, <laughs> to talk about and collaborating with who and, and the IEEE, this aligns as well. Thank you, Dr. Prabhakaram. Dr. Jose, I see you're on the line as well. Uh, we really appreciate it, guys. This is wonderful. And uh, we'll uh, be shouting your accolades for times to come yet. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.